Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you so much for having me in Hong Kong. And this is my very first Hong Kong trip that I cannot believe that it's, it's like 2024 already and it's my first time. Um, and thank you, I'm very happy to see so many people and all of you come to he, um, support me because I, I don't really know many people living in Hong Kong, so I'm, I was very worried. <laughs> um, nobody can show up, but and here you are, come to help me, yes. So thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to play you a slideshow today. <laughs> um, I'm including some of my works. Um, so um, I think most people know me about from my uh, long-term project called Experimental Relationship from 2007. It's um, for 14 years already. Oh, no, not 14 years. Uh, 17 years already. Um, project, um, which I started with my um, partner, Mauro. And the, the photo you see here is my very first photograph of Mauro. And Mauro and I, we met in uh, the school in the United States. Uh, we went to University of Memphis uh, in the same year. And I saw him on the first day of school. And there was an international student orientation, and um, I see like in a group of international students, I, I spotted this like very handsome young man. Um, he he kind of looks mysterious, uh, and he was tanned, and I couldn't tell how old he was or where he's from. And he was introducing himself to everyone. He said, "I come here to study um, jazz. I'm a bass player," and I immediately have such a good impression of him because I always like musician and he's very handsome. And at the time I I, I have a very weird thought uh, I never had before. I was thinking, um, this guy looks so cool. I wonder how it feels like to be his girlfriend. I was very, very curious about him. And I always remember uh, this boy uh, in, my sa in the same school, but I didn't talk to him that time. And I always hoped I can find him again on the campus. So I always like uh, walk towards the music building because I think that's where he is. I hope to bump into him. And finally, a year later, um, I was walking to the music building again. And I saw him coming out. And I was like, oh my god, it's, it's him. And I have a camera with me. So I just uh, walk up to him I say, I'm a, I'm a photographer. Um, can you? Can I take some photo of you? And he said yes. And and then after he saying yes, we just uh, walk into the music building and find a window. And he was just sitting there, let me taking uh, the very first photograph. And that's how we um, how we started our um, not starting relationship, but how we started knowing each other uh, with the photos. And um, and this this photograph is before the experimental relationship project. Um, after I got to know him, I always use my photo assignment as excuse to see him more. And and later on, he finally become my boyfriend. And once he become my boyfriend, I start to um, use him daily for my photo assignment. At the time, I was. Uh, I was just very happy that I have this available model all the time. And I was doing a crime scene photo project. And in many of my photos, he was just being there. Um, like this one, I was telling him to get naked and get into my suitcase and play a dead body. And I was very happy with the, my idea of the crime scene project. And I was showing this to my class. and. I think uh, my my teachers and the classmate at that time they look at this photograph and they they just kind of stopped and then they then he hesitated and asked me they say like Pixie um, are you treating Mauro really bad <laughs> and I was very surprised I never thought about I thought they're gonna comment on my photo ideas or my my skills and they're worried about how I treat Mauro. 
And I think this must be some understanding, because I, in my mind, I think he's my boyfriend, and of course yeah, he can help me doing my photos, and um, there's no harm done doing a photo shoot. It's just a photograph. It's, it's not a real thing. But I think to many people, maybe this is not what a boyfriend usually will agree to, to be photographed in this way. And then I think maybe there's something different about our relationship. Maybe I have this very unique boyfriend that, I, that we have a, something different. And I start to think maybe I can do, um, turn the camera towards us and start doing um, photo together. And my idea was to try to show people how, how natural it is or how our relationship is. It's actually normal. Um, so this is my very first photograph, um, and then once I'm doing that for that photo shoot, I suddenly I, I feel that there's a lot of joy in doing this because for this photo shoot I um, I was like choking him and um, kissing him at the same time, and I think like doing this photo shoot it's almost like a game that we're playing. It's like I'm doing a photo shoot, but also I'm, I was playing with him and we. And I really like this feeling of doing that. And I think, oh, this is what I like to do. And I start to do more self-portrait with him. I think this is my very, the second photo from this project. And this this photo actually um, is very crucial for uh, my relationship project um, because in this photograph, you can see Moro is the one who is holding a, a cable release in his hand. So he was the person who actually took the picture. And the reason for that it was because um, I was using a film camera and use an air bulb that you have to squeeze with one hand and, uh, and then the shutter can be released. But it's very tight. With my hand powered, I just couldn't do it. So I give him this cable release. Um, but when I see this picture, I realize there's a connection between my action of pinching his nipple. It's almost like remote controlling him. And then he clicks the shutter, and then it takes the picture, and the cable release will come out of the image and extend to the audience. And there's a, a full circle going around. And it certainly taught me this um, keeping a cable release in my photograph can be used as a clue for the image. And also at the same time, I feel like um, it's like a confusion, like who is actually the photographer or who is the one who's in control. It's also like a sharing of power with him. And of course, this um, photograph is um, from the inspiration from my, uh, one of my favorite painting of this um, pinching nipple. Um, of two women. Um, and this is another early photograph. And this one, um, I think for me, this photograph, when I was imagining this photograph, because I always have this idea, I think men and women are very similar. We are unisex, uh, we should be the same. And also because we, we, we are both Asian and we both had very short hair, and I was imagining if we were lying naked on top of each other and without showing our body parts, people won't be able to tell who's man and who's woman. So I have this idea and I took this photo. But when I see this um, picture, I realize there's still like tiny trace that you can tell who is man and who's woman. And, and this is something great about photography is the, it is almost like um, experiment, like you put your ideas into the experiment, and then it shows the result, and then it teaches you something about the reality. Um, and um, this, this photograph it was inspired by one of the magazine cover that I saw when I was a teenager. And there was this Janet Jackson's uh, Rolling Stone magazine cover. At the time, I was very shocked about this photo. I thought she was super brave. And I just always remember the, a huge pair of male hands covering her breast. And I think I want to have a, a version of my own. So I did this photograph. But 
I think in order, because my hand is not very feminine, um, I did another photograph turning to the side. So this one is, every man needs a woman to keep him on track, and the other one is, I told you so. Um, and these two photographs um, live like a pair of conjoined twins. Um, this is, I always have many ideas about an ideal relationship. I feel like um, when two people are a couple, you are no longer um, two individuals, you become one unit. One person's ability is so you, uh, limited, but two people um, become a unit, you can, be, can do greater things. So I think um, these two photos, I'm trying to make us look like a conjoined twins, like become one body. And this one, start your day with a good breakfast together. This photograph um, um, was, was actually inspired by Araki's uh, photo, one of his photo of a woman sitting like on the street and she was have, eating a watermelon and a watermelon is weird. And I was very fascinated by the shape of papaya and I think how fun it would be if I replaced man, man's penis with a papaya. Um, and I took this photograph, I really like it. But Moro, he's usually very, um, very okay with my photo, like he, he almost never rejected me and he, he wouldn't say he didn't like this one or that one. But this photo, he told me he didn't like it. And I was very worried, like, he never told me he didn't like a photo, like, but why he didn't like it. And so he told me, he said, in this photo, like, my hair was not good. <laughs> and, and I think, I think this is something I need to learn. It's, it's the reason why I can do this project with him is he is a, a man that is not a usual man that you would expect a man would think. He has his own um, kind of system. He has his own boundary. He, he has his own rules. Like, um, like he need to keep, like he, he doesn't like uh, full frontal naked photos, so that's a no. And also he need to be comfortable and also he really pay attention to his hair. So these are the rules I need to obey in order to keep working with him. So I kind of learned from early beginning, like, you know, I can do many, many things, but I need to obey his rules. Um, this homemade sushi is one of my favorite photographs. Um, I think this one, the idea come from my, a joke that I read. Um, there was this woman who, before she goes to work, she, she, she get up very early, go to work, but her husband still lie on the bed sound asleep. And she look at him, she was thinking, oh, he looks so cute. Um, and then she tied him up with a blanket with, and with the belt on the outside. And then she left for work. And when she go back um, in the evening, and her, her husband has been lying on the bed tied up the whole day, and his, his face is all red, and he's very pissed. And I was laughing at this joke, and I was like, ah, oh, this is so horrible, but I really get why this woman is doing that. I kind of sometimes have the very same feeling. But there are many things, like there's, there's a desire you want to do things, but it's, at the same time, you know you shouldn't do it. Um, but I think with photography, it helps me to realize some of these desires. So this is my way of doing it, but without tying more up for the whole day. And, and also, of course, this uh, is a also inspired by a Japanese food trend at that time called New Tai Mori. It's like you eat a sushi banquet over a naked female body. And I think I was kind of joking about him being Japanese and he's become a sushi roll. Um, and this, this, this photograph um, is kind of different photograph from my other photos in the project, because um, you will see most of my photos very colorful, very bright and light and happy, and this one is kind of dark, and I have maybe one more dark photograph in this show. 
It's it's quite rare because 2010 is the time like after one year we graduated and we moved to New York together. In the beginning of our relationship, um, I was I was five years I'm five years older than him, and when I met him, I was a grad student and I had work experience, and he was there just as an undergrad, just freshly graduated from a Japanese high school and then go to U.S. and met this strange woman. So I felt like at the time I, I'm, I was very much the adult in the relationship and he was the kid. But 2010, when we go to New York, start to look for a job, make a living, I suddenly felt like our difference is gone because we all have to start new in this new American society. We, all, we both need to figure out who we want to be. Um, so I was looking at my old photos and I was thinking about how maybe I was acting too dominant in our relationship and also in the photograph. And maybe that is not good for his growth as a man or for our relationship. And I was having a lot of negative thoughts about our relationship. And that's how I felt about this, um, um, for, I felt about us, and this is why I take uh, this photograph. It's very dark and kind of creepy. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and and this is um, my very first um, outdoor photo shoot uh, in the woods in Woodstock, and at the time I was doing a residency there, and that was the, a chance that we could do outdoor photos. Before everybody wakes up, we go to the forest, take off our clothes, and just quickly do the photos. Um, and I think it's for us, it's quite brave because we are both very shy. We, most of our photos are indoors, and, and nobody sees us when we're doing that. Um, in this photo, I think, um, people know that my, I'm a stage photographer. I usually do photos pre-planned, but this one is kind of um, a different one because this is more, it's a reaction to his reaction during a photo shoot. When I was touching his lips, he gave me this look that I, I recognized. This is the, how he looked at me sometime in our daily life, and I was very moved by that, so I took this photo. So it's more like a um, a snapshot, and I think that photo, when I look at it, I feel like it has so much more life than my previous ones, because I never expect him to be himself. I just want him to kind of fulfill my ideas and help me to finish my photograph. I never thought um, he need to be himself, but in this photograph, I've, I can feel it's him, and then that's what made this photograph so much more alive. And then I think this one is a kind of turning point for me to realize sometimes I don't really need to control every details in my photograph. I need to let him in and let him kind of be more natural or um, improvise during the photo shoot. And this one, it's never been easy to carry you. Um, this is a failed photograph. Um, you, you see there's a lot of white space on top of the image. And this one, my original position should be much taller in the picture. But at a time during the photo shoot, even though he's very skinny, he's heavier than I expected. And he kept pushing me down, and I just couldn't call my position. So when I see this image scanned, I was very disappointed. I think, oh, this composition has ruined it. So my idea, this one is, is fair. I cannot use it anymore. And it took me a while to realize that's how I felt about um, in my own relationship with him. Because a lot of time, I feel like I always think of myself as a very strong, independent woman, that I can handle a lot of burden, um, like all the pressure in life um, to carry him. But the, the truth is, a lot of time I, I actually struggle. I'm not that strong. And I think this, this photograph is a perfect example of that, and it shows me 
how I felt and uh, how it actually is in, in real life. And once I realized that, I think this become one of um, the most truthful photograph. And it's, uh, so I titled it, it's, it's Never Been Easy to Carry You. And, and in this photograph, you can see the camera that I, I have been using since, since the starting of my project. I got this second hand when I was a photo student. It's a Bronica 645 uh, small medium format camera. And, and there's a cable coming out, and that's how I take the picture. And I use your tripod to hold it because it's very slow shutter speed. Um, the reason why I keep using this camera is not because this is the best camera, it's because this, this camera is um, big enough for me to make images, but also at the same time, it's small enough for me to carry around. And I tried better camera, but those are just too big for me or too heavy for me. I couldn't carry it. And I'm so used to it, so I don't need to think how to operate, and so I just keep using the same camera. Uh, this one is also in the show somewhere. Um, uh, oh, I'm just skipping through. Sometimes I just make photograph when I um, when I go to a space and I find something really interesting and those like for example this one and I I found this clothes hanger in my friend's apartment <laughs> and I immediately thought I should hang more up. It's got a hand in there. Um, this is um, my the photo that make me most proud. Um, because in the very beginning, I always had moral the cable release because I was so weak, I couldn't take my own picture. And by 2017, I think maybe around 2016, I, I feel like I really need to be stronger because even though no matter how strong I think I am as a woman, the only thing I cannot overcome is my physical power. I'm physically weaker, and I think I, I don't want to be always that weak. I want to be stronger, so I keep uh, start working out. And by 2017, I was able to lift him up. That was my almost like a life goal being achieved. Then I was so proud of myself that I have to take this photograph. But you know, I couldn't hold him very long, but maybe for one fourth a second that I can complete this photograph, that's enough for me. Um, yeah, I think this one is also in this um, in this show. This is also because um, I'm, I saw this apartment in Copenhagen, and they have a very large sliding door. I was like, oh, that's that's very rare. I've never seen this before. So we are becoming the door stopper of this this door. Um, and this photograph um, is also inspired by the location. I, s I found this really beautiful old Japanese hotel in Japan, and when I saw the hotel photos, I was immediately think this remind me of Japanese film. And um, I really like films, and there's one special genre in Japanese film I love. It's called Pinky Violence. And in Pinky Violence, this type of Japanese film, it's, it's Yakuza films, um, like Mafia, and but all the leading characters are female, so it's female Yakuza film. And those, those bad women, they always like to um, dress very beautiful kimonos. And they usually when they fight, they will uh, purposefully open up their clothes, like showing one shoulder or one leg to distract the enemy. So when the, the enemy say, oh, it's a beautiful woman. And then they start to wave their knives and start killing. And I really enjoy that So for this um, uh, Japanese photo shoot. So I, I'm become one of those Yakuza film um, character. And um, you, you can see I was very proud of the very, very slight muscle line on my arm, and I was able to um, click my own photos. And, and th this group is also from uh, in the back of this show, and this is bad wrestling. And this this group, um, 
a photograph is because I always find wrestling photos so uh, interesting and funny because you always see two uh, muscular men uh, half naked and they are very intimate but at the same time they really want to conquer each other and I find there's a lot of similarity between um, the pro wrestler and the lovers because the when you're a couple, you're lovers, you're very intimate, but at the same time, sometimes you're competing with each other. You're like trying to um, beat each other. So I, I did this group of photos because at the same time, what couples do on the bed is can be considered sports. So this is, we are doing a, a wrestling game uh, on the bed. And I studied some of my favorite um, favorite pro, uh, pro wrestling pose and like like this one I think either this one or that one this is called um, stretched oct octopus I think that's one of the most beautiful pose in wrestling because you're spreading out your legs and arms and you two become an octopus together um, and another one I think is very interesting is this photograph. And uh, this is called R Rare Ching Choke. And I choose this pose because it looks very threatening. But one time I had uh, a, sh like a, a lecture and there was a pro wrestler in the audience. And he told me actually this pose uh, for wrestler means something completely different. He told me he said um, professional wrestling is, is a actually a performance. So whatever you think, it looks very tense or cruel or dangerous. Um, when the two wrestlers are fighting so much, they're very tired, they need to take break. So this, is, this hold this like, is actually like a break for two wrestlers. So even though it looks like um, I'm choking him, it's actually a moment of tenderness when the two fighters, the two wrestlers are actually taking a break. Um, and this this um, this group is c called Space Girl Mad uh, Earth Boy, which I shot um, last year when I was visiting Madrid. I always do research on location, um, deciding where to live so I can do photo shoot. And I found this hotel which has um, designed uh, rooms designed by Zaha Hadid. It's very beautiful, all white. Um, sci-fi-ish uh, room and I was like wow I really want to do a photo shoot there so I I imagine there's a, a sci-fi film which um, I play the space girl and the space girl has one task she's coming to earth with her little ray gun and she need to eliminate the toxic uh, masculinity on earth and then she captured her human subject Moro, and, and it turns out Moro is actually completely harmless, and she starts to fall in love with him. So it's actually in a, a love story in the end. Um, and besides my relationship project, I also do For Your Eyes Only, which uh, there, there's some photos in the show too. And for this group, it's uh, mostly you. Um, um, the person in the photograph is, does, is not important, it's mostly about um, body parts and color and composition because I feel like a lot of times people uh, reacting to my relationship project depends on their understanding on genders um, but I don't want people to think too much about the peop um, what kind of relationship it is you know like gender like those things I want people to react to the image directly based on the color composition. And, but at the same time, I can still um, kind of keep my own personality um, in the photograph. And this photograph, Four Fingers, uh, and this one is actually Moro's idea. And nowadays, I feel it's Moro know me so much during a photo shoot. He, he suddenly say, why don't you put your finger through my pants? And he actually knows what I want, what I love, before I even realize what it could be. And I was like, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. This, this is perfect. 
so this is actually his idea, but he, because he knows me too, he, he doesn't like it. It's, like it's not what he wants to do, but he knows that I want to do it. So he, he knows, he gave me this idea. Um, and yeah, and, and a little bit of other works very quickly. So I did made these high heel shoes um, with soft peanuts. Um, this is actually uh, coming from my early experience after graduation from university. I went to uh, work in a big company as an office lady. And uh, as a female employee, I was required to wear high heel shoes. And that was the thing that I hated most about my job because I, I don't like wearing it. And I feel like uh, so uncomfortable. I couldn't imagine why people love wearing high heel shoes so much. Then I start to imagine, like, what if I have a pair of high heel shoes where the heels are made of soft penis, and every step I walk, the ball's going to be bouncing, and that maybe then I can finally enjoy wearing these high heel shoes. Um, and this one is also in the show, it's called a breast spray. And this one also is inspired by something I read online. Um, so there was this, um, um, a robbery happened in Germany and there was this, this woman, she's trying to rob a deli. But the way she robbed the deli is very unique. So when the cashier is opening the cashier machine, she suddenly opened her clothes, showed her breast, and she squeezed her boobs and spilled the milk into cashier's eyes. And the cashier is like blinded by her milk and couldn't see anything, and so she grabbed the money and ran away. And I was very amazed by this woman's action, even though it's a crime. She completely changed the function of a woman's breast from something you represent, motherhood and tenderness and anything positive and beautiful, into a weapon. And I really love this duality of uh, a woman. So that's why I made this um, breast spray, which you can milk the garden as also, I'm like kind of milking Moro, uh, nurturing him, but, but at the same time, it's also an at attack. Um, yeah, and the, the only thing I regret is, I was so concerned about like uh, uh, keeping the milk very fresh, and I put the milk in the refrigerator. So when I was spraying him, it's actually icy cold, but he couldn't say no because it's the, the film is rolling. Um, <laughs> but I, I really regret after finishing the video, he told me, this is horrible, I won't do it again. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I really need to be more considerate um, doing this. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's everything. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pixie, um, for for the sharing. Uh, it's really it's really different when you hear from the artist herself. You learn a lot more about her thinking process, her influences, the story behind. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so I have a few questions, um, but after that, we also want to open it up to you guys to also ask. I'm sure people have questions as well. Um, so I think I just want to start off by thinking about this notion of how. You know, for instance, when we think about Marina Abramovich and Ule, um, they often, um, the camera is the tool to document the performance. Mm. Whereas for your case, you do stay photography where you are performing for the camera. So have you ever thought about that dynamic? Do you think that all your works are necessarily staged for photographs? Have you ever thought that it could also be the camera capturing your performance? Is it one way or the other, or is this boundary like blurred? in your works? How, how do you view this in the context of your work and practice? Mm, I think Marina Abramovich and the Ule um, was actually um, a huge influence on me. I remember when I was um, learning photography and I saw their work and I saw the photo of their, them kissing each other. They were, they were kissing each other until their oxygen exhausted and that photograph of them kissing each other I I think that is the most beautiful photograph I've ever seen. Um, but I think there, for me, uh, for us, I think we, the, the, the huge difference, the big difference is 
they can perform in front of people, and we cannot. We are super shy, so we have to do it just with camera, with no one seeing us. Um, whether it's a performance, I think it's kind of half performance, but it's not a real performance. Like I think for them, they actually endure the whole time, and a lot of time it's very painful. But I think for for me, I'm more. Um, uh, I think more important for me is um, we make this image. So the image, the final result is not. Because, like for example, the sushi photo of Moro, I don't want him to endure the whole time being tied up. But I really want to have this photograph. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that you mentioned, I like how you said that photograph with your th thumb over Moro's mouth, how that kind of felt like it was his participation. How you noticed that that was the way that he looks at you, and you felt it was such a beautiful moment, so you captured it. And um, you've also said how a lot of times you are the orchestrator, you're the director, but he's the one who decides when to click the shutter. You just tell him you're ready, and so sometimes you wait for him. You're like, are, are you going to click again? <laughs> like that moment, that wait, that moment of waiting. So I was wondering, like, what is his level of participation in your works from the beginning to now? How do you think that's evolved, and how do you think that also affects the notion of authorship mm -hmm. for you? Yeah. Mm, I think he, his involvement is from um, just being the model, only the model, to right now he's a big contributor. Like some photograph is the idea is completely from him. Um, but at the same time, I think the authorship, the, the answer is very simple. It's me because I am the person who, in the end, who actually want this photograph taken. If I don't want to have this photograph taken, then it will it won't ever exist. So that make me the author of this photograph. Yeah. Uh, and I have a spicy question for you. Uh, so, what happens if if in an alternate universe, if the relationship ends? Because you know we've known you through the experimental relationship series. Have you ever thought of that? Yeah. From the very beginning, I have this fear, like if he break up with me and I can no longer do this project, that would be very, very sad. So in the beginning, I always imagine like, how can I get a model release? <laughs> but at the same time, it's very hard to ask because I feel like if I ask it, it would change our relationship. It's like I am preparing to you know, what if our relationship ends? You know, I'm already preparing for my after things. So I, I, I could never ask him. But I think um, the longer we are together, the longer we collaborate, the more relaxed that I am. You know, I feel like I have more trust in our relationship. In the very beginning, it's called experiment because I'm not sure how long it will last. It doesn't seem like a long lasting relationship from the very beginning. But the longer we are together, I feel like it's okay. I feel like this is life. And if we break up, then it's the end of it. But I really hope it will last and I can photograph as long as we are together. I love that. Um, I also want to take a moment to also open up and see if anyone here would like to ask some questions. Kobo. In your career for Yo, it's an honor to meet you. I have been following your career for many, many years, and I do have a question that is I don't actually I don't I don't find it anywhere in uh, in any literature that is written about you. Certainly, the the, the dynamic about uh, the gender and so on is very widely spoken, but Something that I really like about your work is that you have a, a capacity to, to use nonverbal language, in, terms of, in this case, composition, to convey that idea very simply. Very, and you mentioned that you're a stage photographer. Uh, I wonder what is your thought process when you are actually thinking about the idea and how can you trans bring that into, a, into something tangible, into a photo, like 
because I do notice that your compositions focus a lot into light as a photographer. You play a lot with the light to a point. In most of the photos are like the main character. Uh, there's a lot of minimalism. Color management is fantastic. Color composition. So I wonder if you can tell us about your, your thought process because I'm sure that this is a work of days of thinking about their composition to convey messages very simply. So. Um, th thank you for coming and if, thank you for your question. Um, I think for me um, the thought process is uh, very, very long um, and usually it comes with an idea in the very beginning. It can be a word or an idea of an image, but it takes me a um, very, very long time to actually finalize it because I, I feel like for a photograph it's, it needs 天时地利人 um, into English will be like everything works together. Your geography, people, timing. Like I'm waiting for the point where my ideas is mature enough and all the, everything that I need is, is available. Then I can do the photos. So usually from idea to photos, maybe years um, or sometimes if I'm lucky in months that I can do it. Yeah. Saying sometimes you have ideas for quite a while, and it takes, and it, you don't always immediately realize it as well. Um, and oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, to Jacobo, uh, I think you make a very really good point in observation with your use of color. It's also because uh, Pixie, you were previously also a graphic designer, so sometimes your works also are it shows a bit of that influence as well. And even looking at for instance, the wallpaper, um, also see that graphic influence. Um, yeah. And any more questions? Okay. Oh, um, I, just, I just wanted to, um, to ask if you could speak briefly on the early photos. If, I was just curious the setting of them, if they were in Memphis, um, the ones all before New York, and that house and that... that that structure. Um, yeah, the, the early photos, uh, I think uh, this one, this one, this one, this one, I think until this one are all made in Memphis. And in this one, you can see this is where we live as an international student. We have very poor. Uh, bed which we pick up on the street, it's random mattresses stacked together and it kind of remind me of the story of uh, the princess uh, on the pea. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, uh, I think uh, when you were a student you just have to do is what, what you had but then I, I moved to New York, and and I just shoot with OK to shoot, which is our kitchen. The only room has good light. Um, and then I think after that, I realized I really need locations, and I start to look for. For example, this one is actually my hairstylist room, and I just borrow it. I said, "Can you go away and let us take some photograph?" Or sometimes I travel. Um, or borrow friends' home to do photo shoot, and I think location is really important. It's a big um, uh, source for where the photo idea comes from. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for talking about your work. Um, I'm so curious to know about. So you said you're like quite shy people, and in a performance context, you get quite shy. How does that sort of change, and how does your relationship to being self-conscious in that way change when you take photographs? Do you kind of have any kind of persona you feel like you slip into when you are taking photos or characters or things like that? Yeah, I do. I I I kind of feel like. Um, um, I mean, I'm very shy, but maybe I don't seem shy, um, especially when I'm showing my naked photo with, in public. Um, 
But I feel like when I'm in this photograph, when we were in a photograph, we, we are, like you said, we are like playing roles. So we feel like this is not us, we are acting. So, or performing, and then it's okay. But I really feel shy if we have a Zoom call and I'm in my living room and if it's the background is not blurred, um, that I feel really shy. Um, yeah, that's how I overcome my shyness and do this. Yeah, I think oftentimes, um, Pixie, I feel like you take on this persona, and I really love how you said that. A lot of the roles that you perform in your photographs is like a fantasy. It's a projection of what you imagine. Um, and I love the idea of like the fantasy versus reality as well. Um, yeah, actually, I was also wondering, because um, like you've said also over the years, you've felt that you've learned a bit more about yourself, what the relationship means to you. Um, and I love how when you said experimental relationship, you named it that way because it's like an experiment to think about, to experiment and look at the outcome. Um, how do you think this series or this, yeah, this photographic series has grown with your relationship? And how has your dynamic changed as well in front of the camera, behind the camera? Maybe more in front of the camera. I think mostly the photograph comes from real life and uh, like uh, we go through different stages when we're student, when we just moved to New York and you know, we struggle and then we kind of settle again. Um, and different stage of a relationship, you think very differently and those difference will bring very different ideas and that's why, where most photos come from. Um, but at the same time, sometimes I look at my photos and I realized, oh, this means something in my relationship. And that made me think how I should change or behave in the after life. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.